All right, so I'll move this out of the way. Cool. So yeah, um, in case you guys haven't heard, I wrote a book. Um, it's titled Blockchain Radicals, uh, How Capitalism Ruined Crypto and How to Fix It. It's out on August 8th. Um, so it's already out now for pre-order at repeaterbooks.com. Um, Repeater Books is a really interesting uh, publishing house based in the UK. They very much uh, focus on a lot of, I mean, they focus on radical left-wing publishing, um, but they publish especially like books that are kind of like the type of things that normally like other types of left-wing publishers may not um, be willing to publish or be interested in publishing. So they reached out to me, I think it was, I think it's now almost two years ago, asking me if I would be interested in a book. Um, and so this is kind of like the culmination of, uh, I mean, one from all of the sort of things that I've learned from the podcast and from writing and from getting involved in a blockchain space, uh, as well as kind of like this, I've spent, you know, a year and a half essentially of writing sort of in the background while I was doing everything else. I was, a, uh, yeah, it was basically my life for, for a few months, um, but yeah, so I'm very excited to have it finally come out. And part of the kind of deal of it coming out was that I am no longer anonymous um, or really pseudo anonymous. Uh, people already knew who I was anyways before. Um, but I wrote the book in with my with my real name and my real identity. So I'm basically out of the uh, anon closet. But so in case you don't know, um, this is just a little bit about me. Uh, I've been working in the blockchain space for about five-ish years. I started the blog and podcast around three years ago. Um, I co-founded uh, an uh, a project called Breadchain Cooperative. And uh, I'm also filming a documentary on crypto on top of already sort of like the existing blog and podcast uh, that I run. Um, this is like my little logo for different social media and such and on Discord, of course. Um but yeah, so to for this talk, I just kind of wanted to talk about the overarching structure of how the book is uh, is framed. And uh, essentially, with the book, I what I've done is I've taken uh, inspiration from Gilles Deleuze, who was a French post-Marxist philosopher in the 19... I mean, who's primarily... He wrote a lot in the 1960s uh, through the 70s, 80s. Um, but one particular concept or framework that he created that I thought was really, really good was called his critique of representational thinking. And so the critique of representational thinking is, uh, it comes from his book, Difference and Repetition. Um, to kind of summarize what it is, is it's a critique of the way in which people will often use models of what exists in order to understand uh, new things. Um, so like a, a good example that I like to use uh, is, I'm just going to mute you for a second. Um, um, there you go. So um, a good example that I like to use is the example of the drum machine. So uh, when the drum machine was created, uh, the way that it was kind of presented to the world was as a um, a representation or a uh, a replacement for musicians to be able to play music together uh, who may not have a drummer with them. Um, and so what you could do basically is you could take, you can buy the drum machine, you can press the little buttons on it and you can press play. And then it'll play the beats that you want it to play. And then you can kind of play along with your guitar or whatever instrument that you're playing. And therefore, you know, your, drum, your drummer doesn't come to practice. You can still play with, uh, with some rhythms. Um, and so in this uh, framework of thinking about the drum machine, essentially we're thinking of it like a tree uh, or as a uh, lesser version of a drummer. So in what's really common in like platonic philosophy is you have what's called the ideal form of something like the ideal um like the ideal drummer in this case um like 
being the best thing that you can have, while the drum machine is just a lesser version of it because it doesn't do it, the thing that a drummer can do as well as a drummer can do it. Um, and so Deleuze calls this thinking like a tree or arbor uh, aborescent thinking. But, and this is problematic because what actually happened in history was that the drum machine was used in ways in which people could never be able to drum, right? Like people turned the knobs on the drum machine really high up and they weren't able to uh, possibly play that as a drummer. Um, and so the this essentially meant that the drum machine was able to be used to create new genres of music or new ways of playing music, in fact, and was able to augment already existing musical styles. So the drum machine moved past its representational model in which it was thought of as in the beginning. Um, and so this like begs the question that like perhaps this type of thinking, this representational thinking is like not correct or it's not like uh, a good way of trying to understand uh, new things. Um, and so uh, Deleuze is very famous for being really obsessed with potatoes. Um, and that's because uh, he likes the kind of shape that the roots of the potatoes take. It's called a rhizome. So it's like a, a figure in which there is no clear discernible center. So the center in the arborescent or representational form of thinking, this is uh, the, the center is the ideal form. If we think rhizomatically, then there is no necessary ideal form, but things are instead overlapping one another and are hierarchical, where there's like different hierarchies on top of each other. Um, and so his kind of critique, you know, during that time was kind of generally about philosophy to think about it this way, but he also used it as a way to kind of like critique the left at the time to not be stuck in this, uh, for, in this way of representational thinking, of thinking like a tree. Um, and so my kind of core, one of my core arguments or one of the core problems that I identify with this is that representational thinking is endemic in crypto. It's all over the place, like since the beginning. You know, Bitcoin was posited as a peer-to-peer -peer cash system. Then it was posited as digital gold. Um, oftentimes when it comes to finance, you know, we talk about decentralized finance as being like normal finance, but decentralized in one way or another. Um, we have also terms like decentralized autonomous uh, corporations, which then become decentralized autonomous organizations. But I think, you know, seeing that it was first called decentralized autonomous corporations, like tells a lot about kind of the people who were involved in the beginning and what kind of their, their motives and goals and values were and the type of representations that they're trying to imbue uh, within like the code of a blockchain. Um, and so you have also as well, like terms like code is law. So we're equating code and law as being the same. It's kind of an often thing, uh, a common thing, um, especially during the DAO hack where uh, people who are more hardcore libertarians generally were saying code is law and you can't push back, you can't, you know, revert back the blockchain. Um, we have smart contracts. So people then can like think of it as similar uh, to a, a legal contract like everywhere you look in crypto there is representational thinking and i think this is because people are trying to make sense of this thing that they've created um and so the best way to kind of explain it to people who don't know perhaps anything about it is to try and use metaphors to towards um referring to other already existing models or systems. Um, and so I think this is just like a way of kind of like trying to reduce complexity into something that is like digestible for a particular audience. But I think it's important to note that like the particular metaphors that were used, like digital gold, for example, has its own politics inside of it, right? Like before Bitcoin existed, it was already a conservative libertarian idea to think that the gold standard uh, was like the best form of money or that like 
that the U.S. need to go back to the gold standard. The world need to go back to the gold standard because that's when money was real and true because it was backed by some uh, commodity with inherent value, even though, I mean, it's pretty arguable whether or not gold has any inherent value to it. Um, but what this did, in effect, by using these metaphors, it attracted the, that audience to come to Bitcoin, to come to cryptocurrency. And I think this uh, is a way for crypto marketers to be able to bring on particular audiences who have money and who are able to give them their money if you tell them the right thing, if you tell them the thing that they want to believe, that uh, sort of aligns with their already existing worldview, right? This is like, this is like a, a, a marketing tactic, really. You identify kind of the people's, uh, the people who you want, what their worldview is, and like if you can uh, explain that to them, tell them what they want to hear, they're likely more likely to give you money. Um, and so this is everywhere in crypto. Um, and so this is also a problem in crypto because that means people are kind of uh, putting the how they're thinking about all this technology in a in a box. They're thinking of it as like very particular things which are different than the thing that exists or, or that was created. Um, and so uh, throughout this book, I'm trying to kind of convey this idea that these representational models are endemic and they are a problem that needs to be dealt with. Um, and so I really like this quote from uh, Alfred Korzybski um, that I've used, uh, that I also used in the book, that the map is not the territory. The word is not the thing it describes. Whenever the map is confused with the territory, a semantic disturbance is set up in the organism. The disturbance continues until the limitation of the map is recognized. So my hope with the book is to try and recognize the disturbance and the, that is happening through the limitation of the map. So like these, these mental models that we're using are all uh, different maps for understanding, you know, what uh, crypto is. Uh, is. Um, and so this map is clearly leading to particular outcomes that a lot of people who like would like to see the best happen in crypto, um, I think become frustrated and not, uh, not like the direction that it is going. Um, but so this is not to say that like, you know, uh, you know, the way that, that, that using metaphor is bad or that like we shouldn't, um, use metaphors that we always have to be like hyper specific um i think and i'll go to the next quote that i really like i think what's important to remember is that all models are wrong but some are useful um and so basically what i'm trying to say is that these different uh metaphors can be useful to certain extents but it's important to not solely rely on one map to recognize the territory, um, right? The crypto territory is not solely about like creating digital gold. To a Bitcoin maximalist, it might be, but I think like this is clearly a flawed way um, in trying to understand this thing in its totality. Um, and so in the book, um, these are the sections on uh, the table of contents. I've separated the book into three sections which go from essentially the like most common uh representational models that are used to try and understand the technology um from like kind of where it started to where it is kind of now and i think perhaps like a little bit um from the worst to least bad i would say so section one is crypto as money section two is crypto as finance and section three is crypto as coordination and so what I think we've seen over the years is that crypto over time has more and more kind of broken out of the boundaries of its representational model uh, as it gets redefined over and over again in order to create new maps for then the territory that kind of springs about, you know. Um, and so... Uh, yeah, so like in each section, I try to go through like where I believe like these kind of metaphors are coming from, how these metaphors are perhaps sometimes correct, how they are uh, oftentimes incorrect, um, 
and how like we can rethink the way that we're even thinking about you know money or finance or coordination and uh, rethink those things in new ways in different ways uh, than what is the kind of status quo of as, as those things exist now um, and so yeah and then through that at the end I kind of play on uh, Evgeny Morozov's uh, term techno solutionism and propose a different framework for understanding or for uh, acting in this space. Um, so techno solutionism, in case you don't know, is like this idea that oftentimes in tech, people will create solutions that are uh, technical to a problem that is perhaps political or something else. Uh, and they'll say that this is kind of like, uh, you know, a wrong way of thinking about um, uh, I need of thinking about like how to solve problems. Um, and so I propose techno probabilism as a kind of alternative to, to this and thinking about how to uh, act in the space. Um, so yeah, uh, about using, uh, he's writing a book, the blockchain socialist. I'll put it on the bigger screen in a minute. But, but, uh, he's writing gotta... a book on how to use crypto for good. <laughs> I think they're uh, <laughs> maybe with a bunch of people at the mute. Um, so yeah, so that's the table of contents. And yeah, so this is the kind of some of the quotes that I've gotten. I've been really lucky to get quotes from Vitalik, from Nick Cernicek, uh, who's the guy who wrote The Accelerationist Manifesto. Um, platform capitalism and uh, inventing the future, and as well Primavera de Filippi and like six other people. Um, if you go to my website, there's a, a, a link called Book, and you can see kind of like all the different quotes that I've gotten from people. If you're interested, um, and yeah, so that is the book. Um, it's coming out August eighth, like I said. You can scan the QR code if you want. It'll take you to the Repeater Books page to pre-order the book. Um, they're based in the UK. So if you're based somewhere far away, um, there may be some shipping, uh, or you may have to look for, uh, uh, either Amazon or somewhere else to find, uh, books that are, that are shipped, um, maybe more cheaply. But if you order from there, you also get a free ebook. So you can, um, yeah, you can, you can, you can start reading it right away anyways, uh, when the date comes out. Uh, through an ebook. So yeah, that is it. Um, and then I figured now we can do some some Q and A. If you guys are up for it, if anybody has any questions, feel free to to either put it in the chat or if you want to unmute and and ask. Either is fine with me. Hey, t -Rex, could you please mute? Unfortunately, no. <laughs> uh, I muted him on my... I think I'll mute now. So yeah, any thoughts, questions? Uh, Rex can give a review of the first two chapters since he's read it, <laughs> those two so far. Well, I'm, I'm honored to have a copy and uh, so far it's been very refreshing. So. Nice. Which... I'm really enjoying the book. Nice, I'm glad. What for? I'm curious for you. What what makes it refreshing? Well, I'm very used to the um, I guess the the right wing liberal narration, the, the explanations of of blockchain technology. So obviously, this is this as well as your other works and podcasts and so on are 
Oh, very enlightening. <laughs> yes. That's what it is. Thank you. Uh, Chaos God. So looking forward to reading it. Just curious, where do you anticipate the off position to your points coming from once published? Um, I'm thinking, I mean, I don't, I'm curious how it gets received and like which kind of group, um, takes it on more if they do. Like, I think, uh, like the book itself is not meant to be like, you know, answering the question of like, what is blockchain socialism? Like I kept the word socialism out of the book um, because that's not really exactly what I wanted to say. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> Jacobin or like one of these types of left-wing uh, publishers, uh, I imagine will, I'm not sure. I think, I I'm curious what they will say. I don't want to necessarily say that they're going to be completely against it just because they have been before um but I, I like i want to stay open to the fact that maybe they will um so i don't know i think i i propose i i try to connect certain concepts and things that are um in in like in left-wing thoughts but aren't oftentimes connected together uh so i hope that like that is recognized um and that I mean, that, that it at least gets that type of audience to like rethink these types of things. Um, and then what will like crypto people say? I'm not really sure. On it, I like to answer kind of Ben's question as well. Like the audiences that I kept in mind were people who are not necessarily left wing or like would describe themselves as left wing, but who are just like enticed by crypto generally but who maybe feel that it's not like living up to its potential or like they want, just want to learn more about it. I think generally there is like a large group of people who like may not have, like, who don't have necessarily a coherence, like I'm left or I'm right or whatever, but who do feel that institutions are failing them and that like, that crypto is just presenting itself as one potential solution. And so like, that's what attracts them to it because it's, it's, uh, it's oftentimes framed in that way. Uh, so I think my hope is that like by radical, I basically mean like, you know, people who want structures that are completely different to what exists today. And so I'm hoping to kind of like expose people who do feel that type of way, but just towards more like left-wing radical ideas uh, when it comes to like specifically this technology and how that relates. Um, so yeah, so definitely meant for someone who like no also knows just like absolutely nothing about blockchain. Um, so I mean, it is, I'm hoping as well to, you know, get that left-wing crowd who wants to learn more about it. Um, do you talk about soulbound tokens or quadratic voting as mechanisms for governance? I'm interested to hear about these concepts from a platform cooperative perspective. I do a bit, yes. Um, there is def definitely quadratic voting, and I'm pretty sure soulbound tokens I did write about, um, maybe briefly. Um, but yes, like one of the things that I kind of wanted to convey in it is like just the form, the governance forms that people can partake in with. The technology um and so that includes definitely quadratic voting quadratic funding so gitcoin is mentioned in there um and also platform cooperatives uh so yeah i think maybe that is in the chapter that i have on cooperatives which i think is chapter eight or to kind of compare DAOs and platform co-ops um so yeah, definitely. I think the for a more left wing audience, I think it would be interesting to know about these mechanisms. They are, that aren't normally talked about in like mainstream media. I think for a lot of people, it's just kind of like the only thing that they hear about is whatever price going up or down and whatever scam or hack happens. So hopefully, to get them uh, exposed to that will help them rethink some of these things. 
Um, publishing with Peter, so best chance, to be honest. I hope so. Um, one of the reasons, I said yes to Repeater, especially. Like, I was really, really happy when they reached out because I respect their their work a lot. And Mark Fisher, uh, who is one of the founders of Repeater Books, um, was really, really, like, influential for me. So I was, like, really happy when they reached out. Um, what is the simplest way to explain how blockchain can be used for coordination that can't be done using traditional methods? I find most people who are on script are saying, why can't we just do that with traditional money or government? Um, I think one of the easiest things to point to is international type of organizing and coordination. I think oftentimes politics is only seen through the eyes of the nation states. So like only within the territories and bounds of the nation states and as if politics is only played in one country. Uh, for me, like socialism is an international, like inherently international, um, like job, <laughs> like work to do uh, for organizing. So uh, I think that's kind of like one of the easiest ways. Like you, there are just certain things because legally you cannot do them across nation state borders um, that like crypto becomes interesting. And so for me, I think it's, also uh, an idea like i think there is like the liberal framework of like well the state is like what's meant is like the one is like the thing that protects us from from harm and so we should focus on that it's kind of like this liberal electoralism i think whereas i'm more interested in like i don't know just like much more radical politics so oftentimes that means doing things that are like legally in the gray zone for her uh, a lot of things so like just because the state doesn't have like a nice box that your social organization like wants to be a part of doesn't mean that you should and in, in my view doesn't mean that you should kind of like not do it because of that um whenever in my eyes like if the state is like a uh at least at the moment, in the moments, at the moments, like in the West, like it's basically a, it's a bourgeois state, right? Like it, the politicians and the state works and creates laws that are in the interest of the capitalist class, the like wealthy elites oftentimes. Um, so why, why should you see the state as like a legitimate thing to decide whether or not you can do something? Um, and in international settings, I think that's really important. Uh, as well um so like yeah in my mind it's like the, the the state creates laws that make it easy for creating llcs that are highly centralized or highly uh, you know that work better if you have like a couple of big wealthy capitalists because the way that risk is uh you know centralized in a particular place so the states can always kind of like go go to a single person in order to like solve that problem um Whereas like if you need to make a like very complex type of cooperative social organization, just because you don't have a legal wrapper that's recognized in your in your nation state doesn't mean that you shouldn't like just go for it or like just adhere to the laws that it's made not in your interest. Um, what does the content of the book look like compared to the documentary? Um, the documentary is quite different since it's like interviews with people and like shots of people at conferences. Um, so there's not like, I, I, like I quoted like a couple of interviews from, I think like maybe actually maybe like one interview from the podcast. Um, but that's about it. Uh, or maybe two. Um, so that it doesn't come from like, I'm not talking about conferences, uh, or things like that, which the documentary is like mostly filmed at different conferences. Are there any updates in the documentary? Um, yeah, it's taking a uh, documentary is more difficult to make than a book. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I'm working, I have a, a friend of mine who is like my film partner and he's the one who's handling most of the like film things um, and is the one who's like doing most of the editing since I'm not a, like a, a video editor myself. So we're still right now finishing up the like rough sketch of the entire outline of the documentary. Um, so yeah, once 
hopefully that can be done soon. And then I think once that's more clear for us, that's when perhaps we will like hopefully be able to get funding or ask for funding or begin doing grant applications or asking people if they want to help more. Um, you know, if you're, if you happen to be a, uh, like a video editor or involved in film or music in some way, since we also have to make music for the film. Hello, Joshua. Um, first of all, okay. thank you. <clears throat> thank you for doing this. Um, and I have a question that, uh, for example, in a conference, in a meeting of uh, ETC uh, developers, well, the ETC com community, uh, how, how is the reception of the community of, for example, your book? Uh, and, and yeah, all your work. Yeah, so I mean, I can't, I don't know if like for uh, ETH CC specifically, but um, I mean, surprisingly, I did present the book when I was in, I was, I was at a conference in Florence um, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, there was a bunch of people who were like libertarians who are like, you know, if not pretty close to anarcho-capitalists. <laughs> Um, and they said they liked it. Actually, <laughs> I was very surprised. Um, I think the premise of the book itself is not like, I tried to frame it in a way that's not like too explicitly in your face about the politics behind it necessarily. Um, but I think it's also framed in a way that is very agreeable. Like if you look at the, if you look at the evidence, it's kind of like, I think it's not hard to disagree if you're not like, I don't know, a kind of lunatic Bitcoin maximalist or something like that. Um, so I think, yeah, there's, it, it, I, I was very surprised, but they said they liked it and they wanted to, they wanted to read it. <laughs> at least the people who were at the conference that I was at, but these are more kind of academic types. Yeah, it's kind of it's it's my way of kind of like trying to sneak into sneak into the minds of of these people to try to convince them uh, of a more left wing political framework, perhaps. Any other questions or thoughts? Hey, uh, thanks for your talk. I think I have some kind of vague question about the relationship between blockchains and alienation, right? In the way that uh, like workers have been traditionally alienated from the things they produce. Uh, the thing that's kind of funny to me is like, okay, you know, if I buy an NFT or something, like I really can see right, the train, the chain rather of transactions, right? That kind of started with the person who produced the nft and and ended in my you know wallet but on the other hand uh and this is all totally anecdotal but i feel like there's something that is kind of alienating about everything happening behind you know a computer screen right mm -hmm. or you know if uh the the wallet kind of at the start of the chain is just some you know you know hash you know code then you know how much can you really say that there's like a connection there right yeah i think that's i think that's uh a very interesting question i've thought about like similar things as well like um uh like alienation uh for people who may not maybe not know it is kind of like this idea that workers don't uh, they don't feel connected to the thing that like they're actually doing and like what it's, uh, it's kind of like purpose is, or like what, what, what happens, like you're separated from maybe the commodity that you created in the factory, for example, but you don't know like who is receiving it or like who is using it. And as a consumer, you also don't, 
like know who are the workers who maybe created the um the thing that like maybe you're using um so like there's this alienation there's this like disconnect between between these things and that causes like particular psychological effects as well um but yeah i mean i think you have like kind of this uh you know this movement of for example like food that is like bio or organic or like farm to table and like these types of things um which i think shows uh, you should be able to to you should be able to mute natalie for everyone there you go or somebody did it thank you there you go um so uh what was i saying so i so like i think the problem of alienation is partially kind of an information problem it's like like partially an information problem of like not knowing where the things that you are purchasing or consuming like where do they come from uh and where are they going so uh like i think blockchains then are interesting in this context as well but i also agree like being behind a computer screen is somewhat alienating to a certain extent. I think part of that is also the way that platforms are just kind of organized, that we are treated kind of like as commodities on platforms. And so we feel that alienation in particular. Uh, so like the, 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 the structure of the, of like social media platforms, for example, are, are done in a way in order to like extract profits from what you do right so like it's not created in a way to kind of facilitate meaningful interactions between people necessarily they are meant to make a profit so um yeah like uh it's it's i think going to be interesting to see whether or not this increase of information and legibility, I think that's the that's like the key word here when it comes to blockchains is legibility. Um, like whether or not that can produce a situation in which there is like a higher amount of like collective intelligence for like where things come from and like where does it go and whether that produces like better um, better outcomes or not. Um, like I think in like particularly like the question of governance, like this is um, really important to kind of not feel alienated from the other people that you're that you're like collaborating with uh, in order to like keep social cohesion. Um, so yeah, so I don't know if that answers your question in particular <laughs> or what the the half question uh, that was bubbling up, but. The kind of some thing, some of the things I've been thinking about. Totally, yeah. I was just looking for your thoughts, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Cool. <clears throat> and sorry for those who who came late. Um, I am recording this though, so you uh, should be able to watch it on YouTube later. But feel free to ask uh, any more questions if you have. if there are any more questions or criticisms as well. Also, in case you can't see my, I have the book on display on my shelf up here. Do I talk about Ko-Fi? Um, unfortunately, Ko-Fi happened after the book was really, um, like finalized, so wasn't able to talk about it um, so much. There are uh, things about mutual credit, for example, um, which is kind of like a Ko-Fi related uh, thing. Um, so there's that, and then there like many of the examples that I use throughout the book are. Uh, projects that were involved in uh, in in the Ko-Fi 
um, uh, conference that happened not too long ago. Do you think blockchain will be useful in the international governance of AI systems or can that be done in another way? Um, so I do have a, I do talk a little bit about AI in one of the last chapters. Uh, I think one of the more difficult things with AI and governing it is like the, like the AI doesn't get computed or doesn't like, it doesn't, it doesn't exist on the blockchain, right? It can exist. Like these models can exist like on your own computer, right? You can do like edge computing uh, with AI or they exist with like open AI or, or whatever else. So like there isn't like this direct on-chain connection <clears throat> most of the time, but there are some interesting examples like Holly Dow. Um, in case you don't know, like Holly, Holly plus, uh, or Holly Herndon, in case you don't know her is an artist. Um, she sings and she uses a lot of like neural networks and AIs and machine learning in order to, uh, make her music. And she created a model of her voice, like way before all of this, like voice AI stuff came out. She had a, an AI model of her voice called Holly plus and uh, she open sourced Holly Plus, so anybody can go and access the model and like sing into a microphone and have it output a um, uh, like th that song, but in her voice, right? So you can basically sing as Holly. Um, and so uh, they basically what they did to kind of solve this problem of like people perhaps trying to like pull off, you know, songs as being as if it was from her. Um, they created a DAO called Holly DAO. And uh, basically any artist is able to submit their song made with Holly Plus to the DAO. And then the DAO who is members are made up of people who are like Holly's friends and her family, people that she knows. They can vote on whether to turn that song into an official NFT and the sale of that NFT then goes to those who are in the DAO and to the artist themselves as well. Um, and so it was like an interesting way of using kind of like social consensus to deal with the problem of legitimacy in this context of authors uh, or of uh, artists um, that I thought was really, really interesting. It doesn't have like a direct on-chain governance of the AI model itself, but it's something that's pretty close. Um, but using more of a, you know, uh, kind of like a social mechanism, I would say. Um, yeah, but I thought that was like a really, really interesting example. Um, and they're very, uh, they're very cool people. Uh, Holly Herndon and Matt Dryhurst, um, they're two. They're a couple and, and they make music together, uh, but they have a podcast called Interdependence. That's really cool. Um, in case you want to listen to more podcasts. But they've been talking about AI and music for a very long time. So they're generally pretty ahead of that. And yeah, Ko-Fi is a collaborative finance. That was, there was a, a recent uh, event in Vienna uh, at the Commons Hub the Crypto Commons Association. Um, collaborative finance is a term that I think Ethan Buckman just kind of made uh, to kind of talk about this specific thing. And it's kind of like a rethink, it's meant to be like a rethinking of finance um, as being a more, in a more collaborative way, I guess. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of people who are in like the community currency space that were there. Uh, mutual credit systems, uh, local exchange trade uh, systems, um, a lot of these like alternative currency and alternative money type of stuff. So it's very, very interesting to have like these kind of old school alternative economic people and then uh, crypto people as well in the same room. Um, it was a super, super interesting event. All right. 
Is there anyone else? All right, cool. Then I think I will, uh, I'll stop recording now then. Um, thanks a lot for joining and for listening to me talk about my book. I hope it was interesting. I hope uh, it has coerced you into potentially pre-ordering. Um, I'll also be doing book events in different places. So uh, next week, I'll be going to ETH Barcelona. If you happen to be there, I'll be bringing some books, uh, signing them um, if, you, if you purchase them there. And as well, we're planning an event in New York City. Uh, likely on, I think it's July 23rd. It's on a Sunday. Um, let's double check. Yeah, July 23rd. Um, well, we'll be doing a book event there. So I'll be selling books that you can buy and I'll sign them. Uh, I'll also be at MetaFest, which is in Croatia, in Pula. And then I'll also be uh, at the Crypto Commons Gathering, which is in uh, outside of Vienna. So I definitely highly recommend the Crypto Commons Gathering um, if you can ever make it out there. Definitely uh, one of the best events, one of the best events around when it comes to crypto and like thinking about it in a, in a political way. So yeah, I'll stop recording. <laughs>